Excellent. So thank you, everybody, for coming. Uh, we uh, we are the hosting this, uh, the Law and Technology Society, and sponsored by Wilson Sincini. Um, I uh, this is the first event of four this week that we're having uh, related to DC um, and uh, and work in general counsel offices. Um, Mark and Priyanka are attorneys in the Boston office of Wilson Sincini. I'll let them introduce themselves and, and take it away. And thank you so much for coming. Okay. Thanks, JP. Could, could everyone hear me okay, or should I be speaking in the mic, or we're good? Oh, well, this is a great turnout. Um, thanks for the thumbs up over there. Uh, <laughs> um, we hope it's because you like, uh, you're all interested in uh, emerging company practices and venture back companies and, uh, and entrepreneurship. Um, uh, but I, I'm guessing Shake Shack had something to do with it. <laughs> uh, that's perfectly okay. Thank you for coming. Uh, I'm Mark Fitzgerald. I'm a uh, corporate partner in the Boston office of Wilson Sonsini Goodrich Ramazzotti. The, uh, the firm uh, started uh, in Silicon Valley before it was called Silicon Valley. Um, we're the largest uh, Silicon Valley firm, kind of um, helped put that area on the map. Uh, 1980 was the Apple IPO. Um, we did them public in uh, December of 1980. Before that, we were working with uh, Fairchild Semiconductor and other kind of tech uh, companies, uh, mostly startup entrepreneurs in garages. Uh, wanting to form companies and get venture back. So that's our, those are our roots. Um, we've uh, moved into Boston in uh, 2016, and uh, Priyanka, I'll let you introduce yourself, but uh, Priyanka is our, uh, was our, in our first summer class, um, and just finished your, I guess you're officially starting your second year yep. uh, as an associate, because our, our, our second year, our first year associates just joined yesterday. Sure. So I'm Priyanka. As Mark said, I'm a first year, now second year, in the corporate group uh, in the Boston office. Um, I was a summer in the Boston office, I think in 2017, and I've been at Wilson for about a year now. Um, and financings are a lot of what I do, so happy to talk to you guys about it. Yeah. So so today, um, you know, we, uh, when I first was corresponding uh, with JP about this, it was um, we, were, we were talking about um, what we might be able to do, and I sent him a copy of our entrepreneurs reports. Um, we do more private company financings than any any firm in the country, and so we have this enormous database on deals and deal terms. And so every quarter, we'll publish uh, what's called the entrepreneurs report. Sometimes we'll have articles um, in there about. Uh, topics relevant to startups and entrepreneurs. Um, but the thing that it's most used for um, is uh, is the deal data. So um, every quarter we'll say, well, what happened this past quarter based on all the deals that we've seen in terms of trends and in, in private company financings? What terms are we seeing? Um, is it a good year? Is it a bad year? Are things going up or down? So that's what we're going to talk to you about today. But to, to give you some, some background for that, um, so you have a, a sense for what does this deal data mean, uh, because we're going to be throwing out some, uh, some deal terms. Uh, it'll be helpful for you to understand what those deal terms mean. And even before that, to kind of understand um, what the, the life cycle of an emerging company is, um, you know, from incorporation, formation, uh, through exit, whether that's being acquired by another company, or in an initial public offering, if they have an IPO and they go public and sell their shares to the general public, that's another form of exit. Um, so we'll give you a little bit of background kind of at the early stage of what these companies are um, and why they are looking for financing. Um, and then we'll go um, into deal terms and, uh, and walk through kind of what we've seen uh, at least in the last quarter, the first half of 2019. Um, now, I'm going to talk a little bit about actually what you get to do, uh, working with startup companies and, and how they're formed and why they need uh, talent on the stage. Sure. So basically, oftentimes when companies come to us, I shouldn't even say company, it's really founders come to us <coughs> and they say, I have this great idea. Um, I need money to implement the idea, especially because I should mention the Boston office has a life sciences focus. And often, 
um, implementing life sciences companies or the ideas behind life sciences companies requires funding. Um, so typically what you would do as a younger associate is first incorporate the company. Um, I don't know if you're familiar with this or you'll become familiar with this if you're not. Um, oftentimes we do Delaware C corporations. Um, and from that stage, basically, a lot of what we do is help actually pair investors with founders. Um, and from there, basically, the goal is to get them to a financing stage so they can get money to further their ideas, to further the company. Um, and there are a few different types of financings. Um, typically, they'll start with a debt financing um, with the goal of bridging them towards an equity financing. So those are the two types of financings we're going to be talking about. And you'll, you'll hear these, these terms. Um, Seed financing, um, bridge financing, um, and uh, Series A financing. Those are kind of the, the early stage financings. Later companies, and we'll go through this in the data, um, are Series B. That's kind of their next level round when they're uh, it's called growth capital. Um, when they've they've already kind of got some customer traction. Now they need to grow their team even more and expand into markets. Um, and then Series C and D financings are, are very much later stage financings, um, usually pre-IPO or to get the company to uh, a level where um, they might make a really good acquisition target. Um, but, but all of these companies and the founders that come to us, their ideas are um, to kind of have a hockey stick growth um, and, and they, they do expect to have an exit. We have. Um, we have lots of companies come to us where they're, um, we call them mom and pop companies that say, you know, I, hey, I want to start a business. Um, it's going to be, you know, not, we're not, we don't have high growth ideas. We don't expect to get funded by anything. We just expect to, you know, get some customers and then have a nice business. Those aren't our types of clients. So, um, but they do come to us because they, everybody hears about us from the brand. Um, but the, the clients we focus on, are the ones that get funded. And, um, and as Priyanka mentioned, um, the different types of funding, at the very earliest stage, you just need some money to kind of start the company and get it going. And, uh, and that's usually even pre-seed. Uh, seed money is usually viewed as uh, the first equity financing. Uh, but pre-seed, that is usually some type of a, uh, convertible debt, which we'll talk about what that is. Um, there's something called the SAFE, uh, Simple Agreement for Future Equity. We'll talk a little bit about that. We don't want to you know, bog you down in the details of what these things are. Um, and then the later, you know, later <coughs> early stage companies, that's when they're doing the Series A financing. Those are usually venture capital funds um, that are institutional investors, and there's a set of terms that they're using to work on. So why don't you talk a little bit about what you do is and saves and durable note and kind of that first, first money coming into the company. Yeah, so oftentimes the first thing that we look at is a term sheet. Um, and the reason we do this is because before you jump to drafting multi-page, 20-page, 30-page documents, you want to make sure that the investors and the company are all on the same page about how money is coming into the company and how eventually the investors will get their payout on the money. Um, so as Mark mentioned, Debt financing is probably one of the more pre-seed stage financing that things because it's um, not that complicated to do, at least compared to an equity financing. Um, so there are several different factors that go into that. So I would say the first thing to consider is interest. And actually, so we do have copies of this report here, if you guys want to take a copy. Um, Let me pass those out. Yeah. You might have to share. So yeah, we're very really happy with the turnout, but we didn't realize it would be so. Um, so yeah. <clears throat> so all those are getting passed out. Um, the the this early stage financing we call them bridge loans because it's a bridge to um, to a. a Venture investor financing, a Series A financing, or even a Series C financing. Um, they bridge the gap um, when the company really doesn't have any money uh, to when they're when they've got enough traction to then go for a, a, a Series A investment. 
example. Um, they're usually not that, and we'll get into to the terms and how much is usually raised, but they're usually not that much money is being raised, and um, and it's usually um, friends and family or high net worth individuals. Um, and the thought is they're very cheap to do and very easy to do. We do them so frequently that we've actually put them up on our website as a, you can do this term sheet that Priyanka was saying, go to our public website, you type in some numbers and it will generate a term sheet for you if you wanted to, uh, uh, to, to raise money that way. Um, they're very cheap to put in place. Um, the reason that they don't take a lot of effort is because um, they don't require evaluation. Um, you don't need to say, hey, my company's worth X. Um, and so that these types of investors don't have to do a lot of diligence to see if the money that they're putting in is really worth what you're saying your company's worth. Um, because what ends up happening is the money they put in, it goes in as debt, and it converts when you get a financial investor who can actually value the company, figure out what it's worth, um, and put, put money into a preferred equity financing, this debt will convert into that same um, same financing, same terms. Uh, the difference is because they're putting in their money early, they usually get a discount, uh, so they get to buy the stock cheaper when it does come out. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And actually looking at like page six of this where we talk about bridge loans, uh, it's, it's funny because I think actually it makes sense to start from the bottom up here because typically when you're negotiating um, a bridge loan, two of the most factors that you, most important factors that you consider are your valuation cap and discount. So as Mark said, when investors come into this round, they say, okay, you know, we're not getting equity in your company, but we're basically bridging you and helping you so that you can eventually get to that equity financing. But in exchange for that, we want some sort of discount um, when you actually do your equity financing. So if you're, you know, if you have a price per share of a dollar for you know those investors in your first equity round they say well we want to buy your shares for 80 cents or something to that effect um on the similar vein something else that they say is well you know you know we're not doing the diligence right now to to set a valuation on the company and valuation of the company basically just means like what is the company worth when we look at you know your assets your potential what ip you have maybe what, what's the company worth is it 10 million dollars 20 million dollars some amount um and oftentimes investors in a bridge loan will say, you know, we haven't done all the diligence yet, but because we're coming in early, we want to set a valuation cap at a certain amount. So if an equity round investor comes in and says, we think your company is worth $30 million, well, we want to say right now that it's worth 20 and that we get the benefit of $20 million. Are you setting a cap at $20 million? So that um, just basically saying that we came in early and we get a benefit of company. The way this cap, this cap actually developed on the east, on the west coast, um, and moved its way over to the east coast about ten years ago. The concept of having a cap, um, and the best way to, to figure out why you need this is you've heard people heard the term unicorn. Pretty know what a unicorn is? Billion dollar valuation uh, for a company. Um, so imagine if you put money into. Um, Pick your, pick your unicorn, Lyft. Uh, you were one of the first investors in Lyft. And you didn't know how to value the company. But you said, look, I'll give you $100,000 to get going. Um, and I'll do it a convertible debt, a bridge, bridge loan. Um, and when you find somebody else who can value the company, I'll convert, uh, my 100,000 will convert, and it'll be, I'll get a 20% discount to the price that the institutional investor pays. Well, if you put in $100,000 uh, and it later turns out that that is a unicorn, and so the first money comes in at a billion dollar valuation, and somebody might put you know, $250 million into the company, your $100,000, even though you're getting it 20% cheaper than, than the person who put in $250 million, your $100,000 is gonna buy a, a tiny, tiny percent of a percent of a percent of the company. So, um, uh, the price cap gives you the benefit of if you end up investing in a unicorn, um, even though somebody's going to put a billion dollar valuation on it, your money will be treated as if there were there were a fifty thousand or fifty million dollar valuation or something like that. So you won't you you'll get a bigger percentage. Um, 
Uh, a lot of times this gets renegotiated later, but at least it's the investor is starting point. Um, so we've talked about bridge bridge valuation and, and convertible debt. Um, is did that is this kind of new material for people, or is, is it somewhat familiar? People have experience with it. Raise your hand if you've heard of convertible debt or bridges before this. Okay, so a handful of people. So how about preferred stock? Are people familiar with venture capital deals? Okay, good. Um, so that's what we're going to talk about next, and then we'll get into the actual terms for what we're seeing. So company has gone forward and um, and raised, let's say, uh, $250,000 by going to high net worth individuals, friends and family. They've done this through convertible debt, bridge loans. This is all pre-C. Um, and nobody spent the time to do any diligence on the company because it just got formed. It's not a lot of diligence to do. Um, and uh, nobody's put a valuation on the company. Um, the first institutional round is usually either a series C round or a series A round. Um, so it used to just be series A rounds, but then um, maybe 15 years ago or so, 20 years ago, I guess, um, they started saying, gee, we don't really need to do a series A round with all the terms and all the documents that go in place for that. Is there a simpler way we can get some equity financing in? And so the concept of series C came up. Those are, it's really a handful of documents, a handful of pages, um, almost filling out a form. Um, and that's the way some very early stage financings are done these days. Um, a lot of this equates to how expensive is the legal fee for a transaction. For a bridge financing, um, it's pretty much, you know, our uh, Triumph has already done yeah. quite a few, so it's usually kind of run by a first year. We even have summer associates that are uh, running uh, convertible uh, debt financings. Uh, we teach you how to do it, so um, you're not, uh, you're not committing malpractice, but, uh, but they're not that difficult kind of to get your head around in terms of how you do them. Um, and we've done so many of them that we, um, we, we make it easy to train people on how to do those. Series C financing is pretty similar. I'd say usually a first year associate or a second year associate um, is working on those. Um, series A transactions, um, we also have summer associates and first years working on Series A, but those usually involve um, uh, larger amounts of money and bigger teams. Um, so it'll probably be like, like you know a partner and associate working on it. Um, this, the, the preferred financings, these venture financings, um, the reason they're called preferred is because they have a type of stock, preferred stock, that has better rights and privileges um, than the common stock. And so we'll talk through what these deal terms are, but why don't you talk about you know, kind of the process for uh, going through a, a Series C or a Series A. Yep. Um, so as with the convertible note thing, I think, you know, the first place you would start with is Series A financing, let's say, is a term sheet. Because like with the convertible note, you don't want to draft now five very large documents without first, you know, getting on the same page about what the terms are. Um, and, and one of the big differences, I would say, between the preferred round and the convertible debt round, um, I know aside from it being stock and not debt, is a lot of things are built directly into the charter and offered as protections um, for that. And I'll just stock. point out, when she threw out five very large documents, it is five. I mean, that's it's like exactly are, five. <laughs> it's exactly five. Yeah. Um, one of them is the charter, <coughs> which is the what you file in Delaware, and that's all the rights, preferences, and privileges of the various types of, of stock. Mm -hmm. So that's the the first sort of thing that you consider, and a very common thing with preferred stock is they say, well, if we're putting in large amounts of money, when there's an exit event or something that happens, we want our money to come out first. Um, and that's basically called the liquidation preference. Um, and, and without getting too much into the weeds of the specific terms, the, the basic concept is some amount will be negotiated um, and they'll say, well, typically we'll come off first and then maybe we'll also get more money when the common stock gets money. But um, the, the big thing is that they're getting paid out first. Um, you'll, you'll see liquidation preference when we go through the deal terms, yep. uh, but conceptually think of it as downside protection for the investor. Mm -hmm. So if the company does really well, then the liquidation preference often doesn't matter and they just get whatever percentage of the company. You know, if they have 20% you know, of, a, of a unicorn of a billion dollar company, well, then they have $200 million that they get back for 
whatever they put in. Liquidation preference just says, well, if it turns out this company gets sold for you know, a million dollars, <laughs> yeah. then the 20 million they put in, they get their they get that all that million goes to them because they get the, they have to get paid their twenty million back before um, anybody else gets paid. Yeah. And then another common factor that comes with preferred rounds is well, all of a sudden, you know, as an investor, I'm putting in so much more money. I want a little bit of more oversight in the company. So often it'll come with, you know, I want a board seat, or I want observer rights, or very commonly, you know, I want protective provisions of some sort. So before you take on a certain amount of debt you have to get my approval. Or oftentimes before you amend the charter, which is what's needed to raise more money, um, you need my approval. So that's a pretty common thing too that you see in preferred rounds that you don't often see in debt rounds. Yeah. Um, and then uh, just to go over it quickly, because some of the, most of these terms that you'll see in the, in the deal term uh, uh, trend analysis are in the charter mm -hmm. that Priyanka was mentioning. Um, there are four other documents in these in these financing deals that provide different rights. Um, you want to just kind of cover quickly what one obviously you have to purchase the stock. So. Yes, yes. So actually, interesting. One of the most interesting documents from at least a junior associate's perspective is the stock purchase agreement. Um, and often, what you'll do as a junior associate is go through the representations and warranties. And Note financing documents also have representations and warranties, but they're much larger in a Series A. Um, and what representations and warranties basically do is the investor says, I'm putting in X amount of money, but I need you to make certain promises to me. Such, you know, for example, you're in good standing, you haven't, you're not a part of any litigation, you have all the intellectual property that you need to run your business. Um, and while they do diligence, um, what reps and warranties do essentially is shift the risk onto the company because they're making certain promises um, through those reps and warranties. So often what you'll do as a junior associate is go through those and make sure they're reasonable or you'll help with the disclosure schedule, which is basically the company making exceptions or writing down exceptions to those disclosures. They'll say, well, you know, the stock purchase agreement says I don't have any litigation but I'm gonna disclose on this schedule that, well, I do have this one outstanding thing going on. So oftentimes that's what you'll do as a junior associate. And that's, I would say, the bulk of the stock purchase agreement. Um, and a lot of that is really just sitting down with a client. Yeah. Um, these are founders who've never seen a legal document before. Um, or sometimes we have, we actually have a lot of repeat on <laughs> they have, but they still expect uh, the law firm to sit down with them and walk through and say, you know, what about this? How do I, how do I, tell the investors about this without scaring them away. Yep. Um, so that's that's what Priyanka was doing. Yeah, or do I even want to tell the investors about this? Because some, some clients feel, you know, I'm an open book, I'm going to be over-inclusive, I'm going to put everything in there. And some clients say, well, do I really have to, do I really have to say this? Um, but okay, so now we've talked about the charter, the stock purchase agreement. The next one is the investor rights agreement, and that's often where you'll see a lot of those investor protections. So it's um, before you do anything, the investor director needs to sign off on these things, or um, I would like certain information rights, so financial statements, or I would like a board observer, or we need to have X number of board meetings and I need to be involved in those board meetings. Um, so that's typically what your investor rights agreement will cover. Um, then you have a voting agreement that will lay out the board. Um, that essentially says, you know, the common stock will get one director, the investors will get one director. There'll be one independent director. Um, and then there's a concept called drag along, which basically says um, if the board and the investors agree to some sort of big sale event, that the rest of the stockholders agree to sign on to it. Um, and then finally, the last one without getting too, too in the weeds here, I'm, I'm worried that I've talked for too long, um, is the right of first refusal and co-sale agreement. Um, and the idea behind that agreement is if the investors are putting in a lot of money, they want to have some say about who the stockholders are going to be. So typically, if um, larger common stockholders called key holders are selling their stock, um, investors want to be able to purchase that first before it goes to some unknown party. Especially like a competitor. Yes, exactly. Um, and all of these ultimately serve to protect the investor and give them some um, basically give them some assurances for the amount of money that they're putting in. Um, how much would you say a typical Series A is for like a life sciences company? 
Uh, well, so for, for, and the data we have is, is for all companies that we work with. We do have it segregated out uh, by different industries. Uh, for a Series A company these days, you basically get somewhere between 10 and 20 million in your first Series A financing um, because you need that. Your first Series A financing for a, a life sciences biotech company um, helps you get to, a, to approval for human trials. And those are, you know, you have a new drug, you file an investigative new, investigational new drug application, um, and that allows you to start testing for safety um, and efficacy, whether the drug might actually work, but primarily safety um, in humans. Uh, so you have to go through a lot just to be able to put that type of a trial together. So you need usually 10 to 20 million, depending on whether you're talking about a cancer drug or like an eye ther therapy or a or some other type of drug. Um, so, um, but that's a good segue into kind of deal trends, uh, which is kind of the topic of what we were talking about. We just wanted to make sure people had the background. Um, uh, was that helpful for folks to kind of understand what kind of this, why, why these companies want money? <laughs> I mean, all companies probably want, even the mom and pop shops uh, want some money, uh, but uh, but the, the ones that we work with, we, we just focus as a firm, we just focus on entrepreneurial venture back type companies. Um, and uh, we don't do you know, oil and gas or brick and mortar companies. Um, and then within Boston, our main focus is on life sciences companies. Um, but our database, uh, we do have another report called the Life Sciences Report, which just talks about life sciences uh, um, trends. But this is, this is the report that's based on hundreds of deals uh, every quarter that we do, and um, and it aggregates them. The methodology is we will knock out some of the outliers, um, uh, but uh, as you'll see in this report, you know we used to knock out some unicorns because we thought, okay, well, there's only like one unicorn that's going to skew this, uh, all the trend data, but now there's so so many. I mean, our firm does a lot of unicorn financings. <laughs> And, uh, and so we're including them in, unless it's like something that's really um, uh, a clear outlier. Um, so that, that causes the, the, the dollar amounts in, these, in this data to go up. Uh, this is all kind of median data from all our deals, um, minus the, uh, the really low outliers and the really high outliers. Um, so first, the, the, the first chart we have, and, uh, and you can follow along in the, in the handout, um, isn't all that uh, inf informative because um, we've had a, a, a period of, um, of great venture capital deal flow um, for, for many years now. Um, there have been a couple downturns, um, but uh, as you can see from this chart, this goes back to Q1 of 2014. Um, this, the top line represents up round financings. So if a company gets its Series A round, that's kind of its first, probably its first round, or maybe a Series Seed round, whatever its first valuation is, um, that's their first deal. This, the next round they do after that um, could be at a higher valuation. So a company might not be a unicorn to start with, but after they get that initial money in and they're able to scale a bit, and now we're looking for growth capital, it's usually, um, expected to be in good years at a higher valuation. Um, the orange line up at the top says, you know, somewhere between 80 and 90 something percent uh, of, of all deals have been up round deals. So the companies have been improving in valuation over the last five years. Um, pretty much almost every deal we do is like that. Um, the only interesting thing I'd point out about this chart is that the green line represents down rounds, oops, oh, I got it back. <laughs> uh, the green line represents down rounds, down rounds, and the purple line represents flat rounds. That means if you get a Series A deal, um, and then a new investor comes in a year later or in a Series B deal, the flat round means they don't increase the valuation. They just say, hey, the company's still doing what it was doing before, we're gonna give it the same valuation it had. Um, it hasn't increased in value. Down round means, um, oh, either the 
the investor who came in first overpriced the deal and thought it was a unicorn, but it wasn't, um, or um, or something uh, they may have priced it right, but something bad happened with the company, and so now its valuation is lower. So the valuation matters because the lower the valuation, the greater percentage the investor will get of the company for the same dollar amount. The higher valuation, the smaller the percentage you get for the same dollar amount. Usually they're focused on percentage. Um, if they have a lot of the funds have a lot of capital, um, they're more focused on percentage. So that means they'll have to pay more uh, for a high valuation company. Uh, but the interesting thing, and even though those are both seem like they're kind of in the weeds, um, the interesting thing to note just from uh, this most recent quarter is that down rounds have been going up and flat rounds have been going down in this last quarter, which is you, you, you can't, there's no crystal ball or anything, but when, when down rounds start going up, um, that means people mispriced um, earlier deals um, or companies aren't as successful, um, but usually it means the pricing got a little bit frothy. And so um, in the past, it's not always the case, but in the past we might have viewed that as an indicator that valuations might not continue to go up. Um, so that's the first slide, our first chart we wanted to talk about. Second one talks about valuation. And um, uh, here, it's kind of an eye chart, but if you look at, if you can look at uh, what you have, uh, have in front of you. Um, we mentioned seed deals. Those are the first equity financings, and those are kind of smaller money, first investment in. Series A, which is really a first institutional investor. In our data, we excluded angel financings, where an angel just calls it a Series A because they don't know what a Series C is. Um, usually, the seed financings are angel financings. Um, and then Series B is growth capital. Series C is really companies just about to go public. Um, uh, and that's the light blue. So, obviously, you know, as those different stages go, the, the valuations get higher. Um, but if you could just focus on any one particular, let's say, you know, look at Series A deals, even though uh, that's the, uh, the maroon one, I guess, on here, yeah. the maroon. Um, if you kind of ignore everything else and you just look at Series A deals, you might say, well, that kind of looks like it's, it's flat, but it's actually not. There was a huge growth. Um, in fact, I think we had the highest Series A valuation last quarter, median valuation. Uh, that we've seen since like 2017. So it's, uh, uh, what does that mean? You know, is the trend that valuations are going up when I just said that uh, we just got an indicator that they might go down in the future? Um, you know, it's, it's, it's just data, but, uh, but at least we're seeing that. I'm sorry, quick, I don't know if we can interrupt. Oh, please, yeah, actually, please. please. Yes. This is meant to, I should have meant that at the beginning. So I'm just curious, this isn't a very long time period. It's, it's only five years. It's, been during like an economic expansion, and yeah. some would say that we're about to enter a recession. How does this yeah. work during a recession? I mean, do you see your deal flow go down? And yeah, it's still question. the same. Um, deal flow doesn't <coughs> go down um, for anyone in our industry. Um, what ends up happening is the you get more complicated deals because there'll be more down rounds. Um, so the, yeah, this this only goes for the past. We we have a kind of a running five years. You know, a year ago, we were showing 2013 on the chart. We just can't. We've been collecting data. Um, we actually have been collecting it in this form since 2000, um, but we actually have the data going back to the 1960s. So, like, what would this have looked like in 2009, 2008? In 2009, the valuations for a let's see, for an A round, uh, it was probably around uh, what is it here? Uh, the lowest is. Is eleven? Is that right? No, five in twenty fourteen. Is that right? Um, a rounds were probably at uh, a million pre money and one to two million pre money, and then a million in for a Series A round. Three million was kind of like the post money valuation in the in that time frame. Um, and of course, when you're getting to those valuations, those low valuations, then it's easier to have a down round or an up round <laughs> because um, you're starting with such a low number. Um, but that's a really good question. Um, and you know, what are the indicators um, for the past three years? People have been saying, geez, it's probably not going to yeah. continue for another year. 
This is the first time, I think, go back to the other slide. Um, uh, I guess maybe, well, I guess in, in 2018, Q2 of 2018, we did have a, we did have a increase in up rounds, but we also had an increase in flat rounds. So, um, yeah, I'm trying to see where on this chart, if there's anything where the uh, down rounds go up and the flat rounds go down. And this seems to be maybe the first time that's happened. I don't know. We'll talk in, talk in three months and we'll see if, uh, if I'm right. <laughs> uh, but I would expect there to be a decrease just in valuations. I don't know if that means there's going to be more, even more down rounds, but I would expect the valuations, average valuations, are probably going to go down. Um, so these are pre-money valuation. Uh, want to explain what pre-money means? versus post money? Yeah, so pre-money valuation is the typically the negotiated term. So that's when they're doing diligence on the company and they're saying, okay, we think your company is worth $10 million. Um, that's also typically what determines your price per share, which determines the percentage of the company that the investors are owning. So basically they'll say, we'll take your pre-money valuation, divide it by however much, you stock, however much stock you have currently, and that's the price that we're paying for the preferred stock. Um, post money valuation is basically the pre-money plus the investment coming in is your post money. Um, and that's typically what you like to consider for the next round, I would say, right? Um, so typically that sets the stage for like, well, if I'm negotiating my next round, um, I know what my post money was for my previous round, so that should sort of be where I'm leaning towards or higher for my next round. Yeah. So your post money, so in the example you use, let's say the free money is 10 million and an investor puts in 5 million, well then they get a third of the company. Because the post money is the 10 plus the 5 that they're putting in. Yep. So the post money valuation is 15 million, of which they put in 5 on top of the 10 pre, and they get a third of the company. Your next deal, if it's a flat round, that means that the pre money valuation for the next deal is 15 million. It's, it hasn't changed from the, after the, money plus the money coming in. Um, if it's anything less than 15 million, it's a down round. If it's anything more than 15 million, it's a down round. Um, so in terms of, that's pre-money, then when the investors put their money in, um, this next chart represents um, how much money, uh, what's the average or median uh, amount raised by a company um, in the same categories, Series C, Series A, B, and C. Um, you'll notice as, as valuations have continued to go up, um, I mentioned earlier, investors usually think more about percentage than they think about dollars, assuming they have a big fund and they have not unlimited dollars, but they have a lot of dry powder, is the term that we use. Um, they will put in money to get the percentage they want. Um, as a result, as valuations go up and they still want to get their threshold percentage of the company, they're putting in more money. So, especially at the later stage, um, you'll see you know, the jump from uh, Q1 2019 to Q2 2019 is fourfold. Um, it went from 10 million going in for Series C and later, uh, over 40 million going in for Series C and later, um, which is, uh, it was a huge, that was a huge quarter for, for deal flow and for money going in. Um, and there were, a lot of unicorn deals. So um, unicorn deal, higher valuation, the funds have to put more money to, to, uh, to get the you want. Um, so again, we'll come back in, a, in three months and, <laughs> and see, uh, see if that holds. Um, but if it, if it holds or goes up, then um, you know, it's hard to imagine. Uh, it takes some time just for, for kind of deal activity to shift in the other direction. So, uh, yeah, question. Yeah, I just, uh, Series C traditionally has been right before IPO. Do you see like Series D, Series E, an increase in, in post rounds or an increase in time between Series C and going IPO? Like, is that staying stable or is there any. That is staying stable. What, what's changed, um, the difficult thing to, to quantify this and why the metric probably isn't isn't as, as useful comparing, comparing years um, is. Uh, there was something called the Jumpstart Our Business Startups Act, the Jobs Act. Um, and it did a lot of things. Um, it didn't have really much to do with jobs, <laughs> but, uh, but it had a lot to do with emerging companies. And one of the big things that it did, and this has been probably 
seven years now or so, six or seven years since, since that started. Um, it, um, it made it so that companies could file for their IPO confidentially, and they could do a lot of the work for the IPO up until they're about to go on the roadshow for the IPO. Um, so an IPO initial public offering, um, it's the first time you're going to raise money from the general public. Um, usually you go out and you get about 20%, um, you sell about 20% of the company's stock and you raise a bunch of money in tech. It's you know hundreds of millions in life sciences, it's probably 100 million or maybe a little less, uh, depending on, on the type of uh, drug company that you're talking about. Um, what used to be the case is, if you wanted to do an IPO, you would have to really kind of um, uh, make sure that you had uh, enough, uh, a good enough company to take public, and the investment bankers usually helped with that. Um, uh, but then you'd have to have an org meeting, spend a lot of money, and file your first filing with the SEC publicly, um, and then everybody could see it. So you might not be completely ready um, you might not be sure that that's what you're going to do, um, but then you'd have to start that process with the SEC and take a few months after that to get it cleared through the SEC. Now you can get all that SEC clearance, uh, the SEC Security and Exchange Commission, um, you can get all that clearance before you let the public know. So you go through the comment process with the SEC, you get your filings all done, you amend your filings, you get that public disclosure document all ready to go, and then you go out the door. The reason I bring this up is because these financings, they usually happen right before um, a company is going to do that. But because of this confidential filing now, the companies will raise their Series D or Series E financing or mezzanine financing, uh, crossover financing, they're sometimes called in life sciences. And then, um, and then they'll say, great, we're gonna go out, they'll get everything done. But then they'll wait for the, the, the market to be right for their IPO. And that waiting period, you can keep renewing it. There's a 90 day, uh, if, you, if you just kind of go quiet with the SEC for 90 days and don't tell them anything, then you'll be kind of taken off uh, and you'll have to update your materials in any event. But we have a lot of companies right now that are in confidential filing, so they could go public at any time, um, but uh, they're waiting for the right time. And uh, so it's really difficult to tell what's the length of time between that and the actual IPO. Um, but the time between that financing and, and the confidential filing is usually within a, a few months. So. And is that like a few months of burn then? Or do they put in like a year of burn? I mean, like what's that 40 million? How you, long are they planning on that to last them? Well, so usually, usually the money that goes in for that financing is to beef up the balance sheet of the IPO. So it's less about, um, well, for life sciences, there is burn because life sciences companies, drug development companies, they don't have any cash. So, so they are burning through that cash. Um, tech companies, they're just trying to beef up the balance sheet. So they usually have enough revenue by the time they're going to go public to be able to not use that. Um, but if they do use it for growth, then they'll have to do another. That, that's why sometimes you'll see a series F. Or that's why actually you'll see a series D or a series E when a series C might crossover like. Um, so amount raised will be going up really kind of at, at all levels um, on this chart and the preferred financings. Um, and uh, as we mentioned earlier, there's this other set of uh, uh, financings before you have evaluation, the convertible debt financings. We've seen those, and we'll get to those um, charts in just a second. We've seen those go down um, in this last quarter. Um, but uh, why don't we go to the next, uh, the final, I think, one that we have here. Another eye chart, so you'll have to look at your, uh, 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 your handouts. Um, but this is, um, and, and frankly, this, there's on the left is all rounds, on the right is down rounds, and as you saw, down rounds are just a small percentage of, uh, of what we're doing. Um, uh, so I would kind of focus on the middle section, which I think is white in the handout. Um, and this is for the past five years, up rounds, which have been over 80% of the rounds we do. Um, what we're seeing on some of the deal terms that Priyanka mentioned. So maybe you can kind of add a little bit more um, description about what these, what these are and what we're seeing. Yeah. 
Um, so earlier we talked about liquidation preference, and what we're seeing with liquidation preference basically for up rounds is over time, it's interesting actually. So the liquidation preference, what happens is when a new finance or investor comes in, they'll say, well, we want to be senior to the previous money that came in. So, you know, if I'm coming in with Series B stock, I want my money to get paid out before the A, you know, in the event in, of a downside, in the downside. Yeah. In the downside. Yeah. Um, but that's actually been going down. Um, and instead, what we've been seeing over the past few years is that it's coming in equal to the previous rounds. Um, I'm not really sure why, Mark. So, so, so that means in a downside scenario, where the company is going to get sold, it's not going to go public, it's going to get sold for lower valuation than people are expecting. Um, uh, Parrot to sue means that the A round, all the prior investors, and the new money coming in, um, they all get out at the same time, uh, not in preference to each other, but among each other, they get out. At the same. So if it doesn't even cover everybody's, then maybe you'll get 50% of your money back, but everybody will get 50% of the money back. Um, including the very early investors. Um, I think the reason that's happening is because, as I mentioned, there's so many up rounds and the valuations are getting higher. Um, having, having it be peri passu is kind of friendly to the company and friendly to the earlier investors. And so uh, term sheets investors these days are just trying to, they don't want to lose a deal, so they're going to give the most favorable term sheet they can uh, to, to the company, to the good companies. So. I think a lot of these will see that the terms are kind of becoming either more company favorable or higher investor favorable. Yeah, yeah. Um, and, and you kind of see that with the participating versus non-participating. So basically what that means, that applies for the liquidation preference. Um, non-participating means, you know, on a downside, the A will get their stock and then the common will get anything if anything happens to be left. Participating sort of flips that around and says, well, I'm going to get my preference. So if I put in 10 million, I'm going to get my 10 million out first. And then I'm also going to get a share of what the common gets. Um, so it's like I'm taking both my cut and I'm participating with the common as well. And usually the, the biggest holder of the common, at least early on, is the founder. Yeah. So. Yep. so it's like not double dipping, but it's kind of like, well, I'm getting my cake and eating it too. <laughs> um, but you can see here that. Non-participating is far more common um, than participating, which is, again, more founder-friendly, more company-friendly. Um, let's see. Anti-dilution protections. Um, you'll see different types of you know, weighted, broad, narrow, ratchet. Uh, basically, the concept here is that broad is the most company-friendly for anti-dilution purposes. Um, full ratchet or narrow is less company-friendly. And the idea for anti-dilution is on down rounds, um, the previous investors coming in will get a little up on their conversion price saying like, well, you know, we want the benefit of the lower valuation as well um, because we came in at a higher valuation. And, and basically what we're seeing now is pretty much always broad based weighted average, which is company friendly um, for the most part. Yeah. It would take probably half an hour to go through yeah. really what <coughs> the, 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 the lo longest uh, part of any of the deal documents yep. is the anti dilution and conversion section of the charter, which yeah. talks about how what happens if there's a down round, what happens if there's an up round, what happens if there's a stock split. Um, it's a lot of math, yep. uh, but basically, it's, it's um, uh, as Priyanka was saying, broad based weighted average means if there's a down round, then everybody kind of takes a hit. Um, in full ratchet, if there's a down round, then everybody except the latest investor, basically. Um, so why don't we move on to bridge? I think you know some of these other ones you don't see pay to play that much. Um, you don't see redemption that much. Um, dividends kind of almost don't matter these days. Uh, so there are a lot of terms that are in documents that uh, don't get heavily negotiated be because these days, uh, because um, they're not that useful these days. Um, they, they will come into play more when, uh, if uh, we start seeing more down round finances. Uh, so that moves us to bridge loans. Um, so this is, we're kind of going backwards now to where we started before. Um, most of the deals, most of the financings we do uh, with startup companies are before 
are to get them, we form the company, yep. um, they need money, we introduce them to investors, um, we help them do the cheapest, fastest possible financing transaction. And that is uh, even cheaper and faster than, than a bridge note financing, it's something called a, a safe financing, simple agreement with future equity. It basically, um, we actually created it um, uh, with Y Combinator out in the valley. Um, it's basically taking all the terms in two or three debt documents that we have, these convertible debt documents, boiling it down to the important stuff and putting it into an agreement that's only a couple pages long, kind of fill in the blanks on. Um, so we tried to, uh, this seems counterintuitive, but we tried to find a way to reduce legal fees on these deals um, because we wanted our companies to get the money to get finance, not spend a lot of it on legal fees, but spend more of it, more of the money that they get to grow the company so that hopefully they'll be more valuable and then we'll be able to help them with, with more complicated uh, deals. But we won't talk about safe financings. We actually have internally, we don't publish it, but internally we have kind of what we see as safe financing trends, but it's not uh, prevalent enough on the East Coast or even you know, uh, nationwide yet for us to be publishing those metrics. Uh, so we published the, the uh, convertible debt deal matrix, uh, metrics. And again, this is what we see. These are, by, by number, these are the most common deals that we'll, we'll do, um, simply because there are a lot of companies just trying to get from that first financing uh, without having to get a pricing uh, and without having to, to kind of go to get to an institutional uh, venture fund. Um, so on these deals, um, as I mentioned, you know, n unlike the preferred deals, which seem to be going up and up and up, we saw a drop uh, this last quarter in the amount raised. Um, and if you look at um, really the, uh, there are two colors here, the, uh, the maroon one, I guess it's maroon, or gray, uh, maroon and, uh, and blue. The maroon one is really kind of, that's pre-seed, so that's before they've had that's the early companies before they've had anybody else come in. The blue ones are sometimes in between an A round and a B round, they might need a bridge round. So there's already been a valuation set and this is just to get them more money. So um, even though your eye gets drawn to the blue ones because those are bigger, <laughs> try to focus on the maroon ones because those are probably what we're normally, the, the types of deals that we're normally doing. And as you see, they're all kind of small deal. They, these are in millions, so, um, you know, the, the average deal size or amount raised uh, this last quarter is $350,000. Um, uh, quarter before that, it was over $700,000. Quarter before that, it was $1.5 million, um, which was kind of a high, and that was the last quarter of 2018. So um, this could be a leading indicator as well. You're seeing kind of amounts raised for bridge loans go down. Um, a few years ago, people were wondering why, uh, well, more than a few years ago, I guess maybe a decade ago, people were wondering why uh, venture deals seem to be happening less and less and at higher valuations. Um, in hindsight, we attribute that to the rise of the bridge line and how quickly you can put those in place, how easy it is to put in place, and how you can get just that initial money in without having to go do a more complicated venture fund. Um, so the fact that these are now going down kind of makes you wonder, well, what does that mean? You know, companies are getting less money. Are they more efficient? I don't know. <laughs> I don't I think know. so, but, you know, yeah. it could be. One, um, thing, one thing I was just thinking was um, technology actually plays a huge role in our firm in the way we do things and the way we draft documents. Um, so I'm almost wondering, because, you know, we can draft these documents using technology, less legal fees. I'm wondering if clients are actually willing to take on less money in, in a bridge loan because it's easier for us to generate the documents and it's not so expensive. So oftentimes you'll say like, okay, well, I don't want to have, you know, legal fees and all of this for someone who's only putting in $10,000, right? Yeah. But if it's not that, you know, expensive to do anymore, maybe I'll do that for $500,000 when normally I'd only do it for like a million dollars, let's say. So I'm wondering if technology plays a role yeah. in that. The other thing that might skew these numbers is there's more um, more of these deals that are happening, these convertible bridge deals, they go out for longer periods of time. And we only put the, the dollar amount, there may be a company that raises some, that raised some money in January of this year, 
and then they raised some more in May. Um, they would be in both those columns. So they might have raised the bulk of their money in January and then just raised a little bit more, as you were saying, because yeah. it doesn't cost that much, um, got another 10000 in May. So that could also be affecting the numbers, and that's a trend we're seeing more. Uh, but this is just kind of to see it's you know much smaller numbers than what we showed before for the venture back financings. Um, and then this is the last talk we have. Yep. And then we'll, we'll open up the video. We'll have a couple minutes at the end for questions if people have questions. But uh, um, these are general deal terms on debt. A lot of these don't really uh, matter anymore. Uh, this includes things like warrants that we used to see more frequently. Um, but uh, I want you to talk through some of the terms on. Yeah, sure. So some of them we talked about previously, like discount, for example. So it looks like from this, we're seeing discount hover around 20%. I would say based on a lot of the deals we do, we're at like 20 to 25% is pretty common. Um, with valuation cap. Well, okay, so we are seeing deals. I would say like 75% of the deals are subject to a valuation cap. There are some convertible note rounds that we do where there is no valuation cap and we're just saying, you know what, we're not gonna we're not gonna touch this concept at all and we're just gonna say whatever you do in the future we'll do we'll get 80% of that price. Um, but the majority of our deals do have a valuation cap. Um, and the, the two other things that I want to touch on I think are maturity and that's basically the thing to consider there is that's setting the timeline. Your mature at the end of your maturity period you either have to pay back the money or it has to convert into something else. So typically when they say a maturity of 12 months or 15 months or 18 months, that means I think I'm going to raise my equity financing around where this note will convert in that period of time. Um, so 12 months I would say is on the lower end, but that's a, an important term to consider as well. And you'll notice, I think we're just the 2014. Yeah, so if you look at the everything on the left, that's pre-seed. Um, so the right half, let's kind of ignore that for now. But everything on the left is pre-seed, and if you look at 2014 for uh, maturity, 16% um, was at 12 months, and uh, and then that has got kind of gone down. Um, uh, it kind of went up a little bit. But if I went even two years before that, it would probably be 20% or. 30% or 50%. It almost used to be that um, all deals were at one year. Um, yeah. And so th things have evolved. Um, we've got five minutes left. Uh, I think, you know, you're welcome to take the reports are also on the website. Um, uh, we're happy to stick around if people have questions or answer questions now. Uh, we'll be here at the front. Thank you for having me.